In this video, I'm going to discuss the differences between the gradient operator and the D operator. I'd highly recommend looking at the description for a link to my video on raising and lowering tensor indexes before watching this one, since I'm going to be building on the ideas from that video. So in this tensor calculus series, I've been talking about two different operators that act on functions. There's the gradient operator, also called the del operator, and there's the D operator. And these two operators are highly related, but they are technically different, and I'd like to compare and contrast them. Unfortunately, there's some confusion in the math and physics community about what these operators are actually called. Some sources, like this textbook called Gravitation, actually call df the gradient of f. While various articles on Wikipedia give df different names, like the exterior derivative and differential one form. To add to the confusion, in some articles, Wikipedia calls the gradient a vector field, and in other articles, it calls the gradient a covector field. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to be calling this symbol del f, or also sometimes the gradient of f, and I'm going to be calling this symbol df, and also sometimes the differential of f, or sometimes the exterior derivative of f. So there may be some sources you come across that call this the gradient of f, but for the purposes of this video, when I talk about the gradient of f, I'm talking about this symbol here. So both the gradient operator and the d operator act on scalar fields. Now the difference is that the gradient of a scalar field gives us a vector field, where the vectors point in the direction of steepest increase, with larger vectors indicating a steeper change. On the other hand, df gives us a covector field, also called a one-form, where the covector curves are given by the level sets of the function f, and the level sets are oriented towards the positive values of f. So del f and df are clearly different. Del f is a vector field, and df is a covector field. So these two ideas are clearly different, but they're also fairly similar, we can see that the orientation of these vectors and these covectors are the same. Both of them point towards the positive values of the function f. Also, the larger vectors, which are shown by long arrows in this image, match up with large covectors, which are shown by densely packed curves in this image. Likewise, the smaller vectors, which are short, match up with the smaller covectors, which are sparsely spaced curves. So again, del f and df are different concepts, but they're also highly related. So what's the connection between the two? Well, in my previous video on raising and lowering tensor indexes, I talked about how there was a special connection between the vector space v and the dual space of covectors v star. And the connection is made by taking the vector v in our vector space and partnering it with the covector v dot something in the dual space. So this v dot something is like a dot product with an empty slot on the right hand side that's waiting to eat another vector. And when we give it another vector, it will produce a scalar. Now it turns out we can make a very similar connection between del f and df. So I'll show you what I mean. So recall that when the covector df acts on the vector v, it gives us the directional derivative of f in the direction of the vector v. And another way of writing the directional derivative of f relative to a velocity vector v is like this. And we know that to compute the directional derivative, we can just take the dot product between the gradient of f and the velocity vector v. So this is interesting. On the left, we have df acting on a vector v. And on the right, we have the gradient of f with a dot product acting on the vector v. So in a sense, this means that df is equal to del f dotted with something, right? These are both functions that take a vector input and produce a scalar. And when we plug in the same vector into each, we get the same answer, the directional derivative. So df and del f dot something are actually the same function. So just as we can pair up a vector v with a partner covector v dot something, we can also partner the vector field del f with the partner covector field del f dot something. And this is equal to the covector field df. So df is the dual covector field 
of the vector field del f, which in this video I call the gradient of f. So if you recall from my previous video on raising and lowering indexes, when we had vector and covector partners, the way we changed from v to v dot something was by using the metric tensor. And the reverse process to go in the other direction was done using the inverse metric tensor, where the components of the inverse metric tensor are defined by this formula here, where when we do a summation with the components of the ordinary metric tensor, we get the Kronecker delta. So let's just remind ourselves how we can use the metric tensor to change between the vector v and the covector v dot something. Well, recall that to compute the dot product v dot w, we can just expand out the vectors as linear combinations of basis vectors in a given basis. So we have the vector components here and the basis vectors here, and if we like, we can rewrite these linear combinations using Einstein notation with implied summations over i. So if we write this dot product, we can expand v and w out as linear combinations using the Einstein notation, and this dot product of the basis vectors just gives us the metric tensor components. So we can see that the key to computing v dot w is done using the components of v and w as well as the components of the metric tensor. Now if we want to compute v dot something, we just remove the vector w from the input slot of the dot product here, and likewise, to get the full component expansion of v dot something, we can take this formula here and just sort of remove the w vector components and get this. And you'll notice I've added these epsilon j's here. These epsilon j's are the covector bases for the dual space defined by this formula here. So I do a more proper derivation of this expression in my Tensors for Beginners video number 16 on raising and lowering tensor indexes, but for this video I'm just going to sort of wave my hand and hope that you can believe me when I say when we're trying to construct this covector, we need to expand it out in a covector basis, which are the epsilons. And the components of this covector would be these components here. So we can in fact see that the metric tensor components help us convert the vector components of v into the covector components of v dot something. So just as we learned in the video on raising and lowering tensor indexes, when we have the vector v and the covector v dot something, we can use the metric tensor to convert between components of v and components of v dot something. And to go in the opposite direction, we use the inverse metric tensor, whose components are defined by this summation equation here with the metric tensor components and the Kronecker delta. So just as this is true with the vector v and the covector v dot something, this is also true with the vector field del f and the covector field df, which is really just del f dot something. So I'll show you why this is true. So we know that the directional derivative df of v is equal to the gradient of f, also called del f, dotted with the vector v. And we can expand each of these vectors out in the Cartesian basis using the Cartesian basis vectors. So this here is just the jth component of the vector v, and this here is just the ith component of the gradient vector del f. And we can bring the components outside and write this dot product of the basis vectors. And now this dot product of basis vectors just gives us the metric tensor components. So this formula right here is the formula for the directional derivative. Now notice here that both df and del f are acting on the vector v. So if we like, we can just remove the vector v from these formulas to get a covector. So both df and del f dot something are covectors. And to get this summation formula for this covector, we just remove the v components and replace them with the covector basis dcj. So since we're building a covector, we need to build these out of basis covectors. So we're adding the basis covectors dcj. So if you're confused about following this step right here, that's because I'm sort of waving my hand and not giving the full explanation for why this is true. A full explanation of this line of reasoning requires an understanding of the tensor product, 
So I'm actually going to include the proof for this line of reasoning in my next video since it will require a little bit of time to explain, but for now you're just going to have to trust me that this is true and just believe that since these are covectors, we need to build them out of basis covectors, which are the DCJs here. Alright, so we know from our previous videos that the DF covector field can be expanded out in the covector basis, like this, where these partial derivatives are the components. So we've discovered that DF is equal to two different things. There's this formula right here, which is the expansion in the covector basis, and there's this formula here, which uses the components of del of F and the metric tensor components. So DF is equal to both of these formulas here. Now notice that both of these formulas involve the basis covectors DCJ. So if these formulas are equal, that means that their components must also be equal. So we get this equation between the components with partial derivatives on the left hand side and a summation over the components of del F and the metric tensor components. Okay, so here we have in fact confirmed that the metric tensor components help us change between the components of the vector field del f and the components of the covector field df, which are these partial derivatives here. Now it would be nice if we could isolate the components of del f on one side, so we need to get rid of these metric tensor components. Now to do that we just remember the definition of the inverse metric tensor components here, and we can see that this gives us the Kronecker delta. So if we do summations on both sides using the inverse metric tensor components, we can change this term here into the Kronecker delta IK. And by the Kronecker delta index cancellation rule, we can cancel out these I indexes and just write this as K. All right, so basically what we've done is we've derived a formula for the components of del F, and these end up being equal to these partial derivatives summed up with the components of the inverse metric tensor. Okay, so we can see that the inverse metric tensor really does take us from the components of df, which are these partial derivatives, to the components of del f, or the gradient of f. And this formula here is really interesting because it gives us the true formula for the components of del f, or the gradient of f. So we can write the gradient of f as a linear combination of these basis vectors, where these components are equal to this term here, or if you prefer, we can write it in the alternative vector notation, where the basis vectors would look like this. Now you might be a bit surprised by this formula, because you've probably calculated the gradient many times before, but never seen the inverse metric tensor components here, like this. So do these inverse metric tensor components really belong in here? Well, recall that in the Cartesian basis, the basis vectors are orthonormal, so the metric tensor components are just the Kronecker delta, which is a bit like the identity matrix. And that means that the components of the inverse metric tensor are also the Kronecker delta, and so that also gives us the identity matrix. So if we use this formula for del f, or the gradient of f, this inverse metric tensor just becomes a Kronecker delta, and we can use the cancellation rule to cancel the j's here, and get k, and then we get this formula. And if we write out this summation over k explicitly, we can see that we get our familiar old formula for the gradient in Cartesian coordinates. Now in polar coordinates, the metric tensor looks like this matrix, as we calculated back in video 11 in this tensor calculus series. So that means that the inverse metric tensor looks like this. So because the matrix is diagonal, we can just take the reciprocal of the diagonal elements to get the inverse matrix. So that means when we take this formula for del f, or the gradient of f, all of the off diagonal elements are zero. So this summation ends up only having two terms, the RR term and the theta theta term. So with these inverse metric tensor components, this is just one, and this is just one over R squared. So the formula for del F, or the gradient of F, in polar coordinates actually looks like this, where we need this extra one over R squared term to make things correct.
And again, I might remind you that my definition of the E theta basis vector is not normalized, so it gets longer as we move farther away from the origin. A lot of textbooks will normalize the E theta basis vector by dividing by R so that it has length 1. And if you're using this definition of the E theta basis vector, then you would end up with only 1 over R here instead of 1 over R squared. But my point is that the formula for del F, or the gradient of F, looks like a linear combination of basis vectors with these partial derivatives. But depending on which coordinate system we're using, we might end up with extra terms like this 1 over r squared term in polar coordinates. And we sometimes need these extra terms in order to get the formula for the gradient right in that coordinate system. And these extra multiplying terms actually come from the components of the inverse metric tensor. So it turns out that these inverse metric tensor components really do belong in this formula for the gradient of f, or del f. Right in the Cartesian coordinate system, the inverse metric tensor just ends up being the identity matrix, so we don't need any extra terms other than the partial derivatives. And this means that the components of del f end up being the exact same as the components of df. But in other coordinate systems, we might not be so lucky, and we might need extra terms. So if you've ever seen the formula for the gradient in spherical coordinates, you probably know that it looks a little bit crazy with all these extra terms here. And all these extra terms actually just come from the inverse metric tensor components. So the inverse metric tensor really does help us get the gradient formula right in every coordinate system. So in your multivariable calculus classes, you might have derived all these terms manually by doing a bunch of substitutions and coordinate changes. But in tensor calculus, we like to think of these extra terms as just the components of the inverse metric tensor. So to summarize this video, if we have some scalar field f, then del f, or the gradient of f, is a vector field where the arrows point along the direction of greatest increase. And df, also called the differential of f, or the exterior derivative of f, is a covector field, which is basically like the level sets of f oriented towards positive values. And just as we can pair a vector v with a partner covector v dot something, we can also pair the vector field del f with the covector field del f dot something, which also turns out to be equal to df. And to move back and forth between vectors and their partner covectors, we just use the metric tensor. And to go in the opposite direction from covectors to partner vectors, we use the inverse metric tensor, whose components are defined by this equation. So more concretely, to go back and forth between the components of del f and df, we can use these two formulas here, with the metric tensor components and inverse metric tensor components. And I'd like to add one last point about notation. So the normal notation for switching between del f and df is normally done using the letter g for the metric tensor and the inverse metric tensor. But there's also this alternative notation I introduced in my video on raising and lowering indexes that involves the flat and sharp symbols from music. So the flat operator can also be used to change del f into df, and the sharp operator can be used to change from df into del f. So this sharp flat notation is a bit strange, but you might see it in some textbooks or online articles. So in the next video, I'm going to more carefully go over the proof of why this formula for del f dot something makes sense, and that will be done using tensor products. And I'll also give a concrete example of computing the components of del f in two different coordinate systems.